of a long day. I'm not going to make uh, a long introduction uh, to Mark, uh, partly because he is in no need of it here. Um, I'd like to thank him very much for agreeing to come and be at this first presentation uh, by the PhD program, uh, and indeed to kind of respond to some of the issues uh, that have been raised, and finally to agree to give uh, a kind of keynote introduction to this first meeting. So it's with enormous pleasure and warmth uh, that I want to uh, introduce Mark, um, to thank him for coming here, uh, and for kind of really, in a sense, lending this first round of talks by PhD students uh, a certain kind of, I don't know if the dignity is the quite the right word. <laughs> the, only, the only problem I have, which is really with his mother actually, is the, the choice of this, his Christian name. I, uh, I feel, find this East Coast proliferation of people called Mark uh, <laughs> extremely worrying. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, uh, no, it was, it, it, I mean, why wouldn't I come? Because it's, uh, it was just really wonderful to listen to these voices, which are the new voices. Um, and the subject of the new is so important and so easily uh, neglected. There, there is a sort of a default assumption that new is a positive term and that old is a negative term. Right, and so basically I want to spend an hour on that sort of dis default feeling, let's say in, in, in the general culture, the culture of uh, today, that new is good and, and, and old is not. And if you work with that feeling that, that um, new is good and old is not, then to say that the digital is not new is to knock them down. Um, but if you don't think that way, you wouldn't interpret it the same way. So I want to quickly answer the question posed by the students in the manifesto. Number one, uh, they're right. Digital technology is itself not new. We don't need to discuss that. Uh, uh, number two, um, nor are the things being done with it very new either. That's it. <laughs> uh, so so that, that's the sort of dealing with the question of the conference. The students are correct. Uh, uh, they, are, they are absolutely appropriately, as scholars, criticizing the discourse around the so-called digital, <coughs> which celebrates the newness of the techniques and the newness of the projects being uh, produced with those uh, techniques. Uh, nevertheless, I think there are important trajectories and we could say even perhaps new trajectories in fabrication, calculations of structure, engineer, and energy analysis, you know, just calculating fires, uh, network production, and so on. There are a number of very important uh, tendencies uh, and that are being worked through in the so-called digital area, which are extremely important and need to be paid great attention to. Precisely when one gets rid of the aura of the new, one can then concentrate on looking at w w what these things are doing. I wanted to elaborate a little bit. I think the language used to describe the work, the positive language used to describe contemporary work in the so-called digital area is identical to the language used in the 1920s to describe what was good about the projects in the 1920s. So we have to try to figure out if certain techniques are new, why it is that the language we are using to describe what we like about the work hasn't changed at all. Is, that, is it just simply that we don't have any new ideas? Is it that we are we have plenty of ideas, but what we're trying to do is to stay with the old ones and so on. What I mean to say is all the positive terms are the same. You know, if you use words like open, mobile, responsive, interactive, networked, and so on, all of those terms are the old positive terms. Um, there's been no shift in the adjectives, and it seems to me one way to do a kind of analysis of um, the sort of trajectories within a discourse is to look at the fate of adjectives. And in fact, if there's no shift in the role of adjectives, there is no shift. I, in as much as ag adjectives qualify uh, and indeed very quickly lead to judgment, um, if there's no qualification, no shift in the way one qualifies, even a shift in the way one describes, then there is no shift at all. And I'm not saying there should be a shift. Right? I'm just saying that's just to be noted. 
And if, if in, a, in a Marshall McLuhan sense, the medium is the message, then certainly at the very least we would say that what we think of as a digital is a product of thinking from, uh, from the World War II, and it's been constant since then. So you could say, in a way, what it is that's been thought with a computer has been constant uh, since the Second World War. But, you know, that's even that's not quite good enough because you could, of course, argue that what was elaborated under the stresses of the Second World War and perfected Im more or less immediately after the war uh, were uh, specific questions that had been raised, in fact, in the First World War and questions of networked intelligence and so on and questions around the telephone in particular and the role that the telephone played in the First War gave birth to techniques and strategies which led to certain people being killed and others not in the Second World War, which led to the computer. So in a certain way, not only is it the case that the kinds of things being said about the work of today are the same as what were said about the 1920s, the, even the technology with which those words are being associated is, is an integral part of the logic of that uh, thinking of the 1920s. So again, I just want to keep repeating the same point again and again and again. So this, is, I think, is already the fourth time of repeating it, but now expand it each time in a little bit more detail. Uh, n number one, to say it again, if you think that telling somebody who uses a computer is not doing anything new is a criticism, then you are the one committed to the concept of new, not the person using uh, uh, the computer. In other words, you're the one that has faith in the new, such that you can express lack of faith in the person that you see not having it. Uh, number two, uh, the category new, of course, presupposes old as its opposite. I was quite struck today by the sense in which people thought new would be opposed to past, but not new to old. And I'm thinking about what that means and why one would tend to say past. And past is quite other than old. But new and old are the opposites, of course. New and old are seen as marked terms. Something is new or something is old. And the assumption is that in the middle there is an unmarked terrain of everyday life. And you single out within that terrain something that's new or something that's old. The middle ground is where things are neither significantly new or significantly old. They're not, not even necessarily things at all. They just, you're swimming there somehow. So somehow you're swimming between things that are marked old and new. And if you keep marking things, then the kind of swimming that you're doing has these markers around it. And you can see yourself moving forward or backwards or sideways or, or all of the rest, but you're not necessarily, not necessarily tuned into the exact currents. Uh, and in fact, the reason you have those markers is because you don't have, uh, like a fish, you don't have any concept of water and don't even know what water is until you're taken out of it, in which case a fish very quickly gets a concept of water. It's that thing you want to get back out into. So in other words, you only have a concept of it when you're out of it and you're not out of your everyday life until you die, you're in it, you don't know it, you mark things, right? And so you mark like a dog on a tree, new, old, new, old, and so on. And it has more or less, by the way, the kind of, all of the elegance of a dog peeing on a tree. And I, I don't know if you've ever talked to dogs about how, how effective that strategy is and, and, and so on, but it would, it would seem to be a sort of, sort of fundamentally architectural act to sort of a sort of, almost a sort of situationist <laughs> act uh, but there's really sort of no evidence that the dog acts upon that act. So in that work, it's, in that sense, it's almost like an artwork. And perhaps that's the way the dogs think, think of it, really. I mean, the domesticated dog is, is sort of, as it were, painting with sort of yellow paint um, uh, 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 at the level of, of, a, of a city. And what if that's what we're doing too, right? That we don't really have a kind of a project, as it were, but we are painting new, old, new, old. Uh, and one of the reasons we're painting new old is, is because we, we actually sort of don't know what the hell we're doing, right? And actually don't necessarily want to know. It's just okay to have that stuff out there. So you, we tend to assume that the new and the old then, and this is not just, a th uh, let's say, a theory. This is sort of built into the way we talk to each other. Uh, we tend to assume that the new and old are, as it were, visible. Um, are perceived as such, that they sort of stand out. They are themselves marked before we mark it. There is a tree, there is a lamppost, or before we mark it, that is to say. While the middle is not, right? But what if the reverse was the case? Right? I want you to consider the possibility that it might be that the new and the old are actually the very hardest things to detect. They are really incredibly difficult to detect such that one might say that the new and the old in architecture might be precisely that which lies beyond our ability to detect them. In other words, what is truly new for architecture and what is truly old 
those are the things that actually the discipline is not able to, to, to uh, grasp. They are precisely those things that a building could not reflect in a simple way, such that all of the conscious work of a discipline could devote itself to architecture as a form of reflection, which is what it is. But in this case, new and old would be actually the words that belong to the things that a building cannot reflect, or we are not able to understand the ways in which it uh, reflects. And I want to try to make some sense of this uh, comment. But it's worse than that. Imagine that you would accept this theory that I'm going to give you about the new and the old not being uh, uh, at all obvious, and in fact, and one of the reasons we go around insistently marking things new and old, new and old, is actually the new and the old escape us. Right? And so you, we frenetically mark as a way of dealing with uh, uh, fear, the fear of not, not, not knowing the old and the new. But that's still not enough. Furthermore, would there be any of us here that would suggest that, for example, a building has any one singular time frame? Wouldn't we be wanting to say, don't we say to ourselves, to our students, to our clients, to our friend, that buildings have multiple times and address multiple times? And one of the great brilliant things about the mind of the architect is a synthetic intelligence which is able to bring all of those different uh, times uh, together. Indeed, might it not be the very function of architecture to allow different times and different senses of times to, as it were, um, kind of cohabitate or exist in proximity such that one actually feels the difference. In other words, it could be that a building is thought of as a kind of a time machine in the sense of a, of a, of a thing that makes time visible by allowing multiple times to operate. And this might be, a, in fact, a, 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 an easy and important way to start to understand what, it makes, what makes the pursuit of the architect quite different from many other fields which can be identified in terms of their attempt to narrow down and produce a more singular sense uh, of, of time. It seems that the archi architect is always involved in allowing as many uh, different time readings as possible. Could be even worse than that. It could be that a sense of newness in an object could only be detected by the, an absence of newness in the very same object. In other words, it could be that not only do multiple times have to be together, that the sense that one reaches in one direction and, and there's a sort of gap in the same point in, this, in the other time zone. So in other words, it's exactly in that sense that an architecture would make time visible because one would feel the absence of things that were in the other time uh, zones. And I think you can immediately in your mind imagine endless examples. This room, of course, is a perfect example. And if it wasn't, I should stop. Right? So there are unbelievably large amounts of time. I invite you to consider the uh, light fittings in this room, which are a veritable archaeology, uh, uh, not only of the AA, but also of, I noticed the, the switch here to the new low energy uh, uh, bulbs, which by the way, if you drop them and the contents come out, that's an absolutely non-biodegradable, one of the worst toxins around. Uh, so there's right now a huge ethical debate about whether one should be helpful to the planet by using those bulbs or, or destroy the planet by using those bulbs, just, just a thought, <laughs> which, would, which would presumably lead to another layer. But, and, but I mean that literally the absence of one or the presence of another trig triggers a sense of time in that sense. It's worse than that, right? It could be that you might even find an architectural object in which it just seems to be in all of those different time zones except for one or two, unbelievably advanced. It's like you're going... You know, you're running out of urine, basically. It's going new, 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 new. Everything is new. And a couple of things old. Like there is a door and there are windows and a few things that have been around for, mil for millennia. <laughs> and those act as a kind of uh, uh, reference point. The absence of anything new about them, the absence of your desire to pee on the doorway and the window, activate your sense that everything else is marked. Right? Now, it could be that, the re that, that an architect Architecture could be filled with all of this uh, newness, as it were, um, could be in that sense even experimental and could be seen as one of the most experimental projects in the field, could be, and the architect or architects could be seen as absolutely committed to sort of mutations and transformations to the new and so on, but could be done precisely in order to maintain the old at another scale. Like what if it is that the door and the window is actually the thing that counts? So all of that other stuff is acting as a kind of uh, a protection for the door and the window. So even if you were to successfully find an object which is, as it were, oozing newness, such that you just endlessly celebrate it and publish it, 
and it would be very likely produced in a school like this one or a school like the one where I am and published by the kind of, we're the kind of people that would, that would be surrounding these things, but the purpose of those things could be fundamentally to maintain an old order, right? So again, that's sort of like point number 17. If you see something that's radically new, you have to be suspicious that it might be acting in the name of the old, right? Uh, the new could be, a, in that sense, uh, evolutionary rather than revolutionary. In other words, it's, it's seeming re revolutionary comment could be actually to do with sort of slowing things down. That would lead one to say uh, that the function of the avant-garde might be to serve the main guard, and isn't that the case? Right, the avant-garde, I suppose, are not so sort of go out there and scout out and have an early battle and then sort of lose contact with the main gang and with the rear guard and with the generals. <laughs> Right? They serve the general. So if you're into the avant-garde thing, it's about serving authority. So what if the avant-garde is serving the main guard, which is serving the rear guard, <laughs> right? and so on? Um, then an object just oozing newness, you should be saying, okay, uh, this is the main guard, right? <laughs> this is the main guard uh, 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 at work. Isn't this like the oldest architecture school in England, or if not in Europe? Yeah. If it's so experimental, <laughs> why did this city allow this school to be, to be what it is? Because at some level it thinks all of this com <coughs> comes to nothing. All of this, I in a way, I is scouting out potential territory for the boring people to occupy, <laughs> right? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, which, by the way, is sort of a way of describing what the architecture as a discipline is about. <coughs> like a set of people who behave in ways that would normally be considered crazy are going to be given a modicum of social support in order that they can scout out possible uh, uh, scenarios, right? Okay, so in terms of this conference, uh, I noticed also that in the students' um, uh, description, the one paragraph description, they make a distinction between the sort of representation and production, right? Um, and I think on the representation side, for what it's worth, my view would be actually architects are pretty advanced. Uh, I actually think really advanced. I, I think uh, one of the signs of that is that architects do visualize new, f new forms of visualization before they arrive. And actually, I think the David Green show is a very good example. You've got some drawings there from 1964 which are playing with a kind of black and white flip in a moment in which those renderings are not yet possible with the computer but will become and it's in the very same year that the first such renderings are published and there were conferences here in London on that. So there's a sense in which uh, late, uh, mid-50s to early 60s, a number of architects already were writing programmatically that the computer would, cybernetics was going to rule the day, and were actually producing renderings as if the computer was there. And as you know, of course, the architects were the very last people in the universe to ever be allowed to use a computer. We think computer and we think young, iPod, radical, uh, the computer goes, military, aerospace, automobiles, big engineering firms, big corporate architecture firms, middle-sized engineering firms, <laughs> middle-sized architecture firms, goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, s decades go by. And then young, irresponsible architecture students <laughs> in radical schools of architecture get it and they invent the computer. <laughs> right? <laughs> but during all of that time, during all of that time, the main guard, that is to say the main guard are the computer jockeys who handed over the technology when it got smaller and cheaper enough to those that don't count, which is us, right? <laughs> to which we then sing the praises of the computer endlessly as if our whole life and everything has changed. So on the representation side, I think actually architects are very, very interesting, and I think those comments about Piranesi are exactly to that point, that Piranesi was visualizing a form of visualization. He was not simply uh, visualizing a space that could not be built. He was visualizing a space that could not be, in a certain sense, visualized. And he was thinking about that. And I think architects, of course, are first and foremost and only in the end uh, thinkers. Um, by the way, that's one of the reasons, that one of the possible explanations of why it is that none of the experiments of today are necessarily that interesting. Uh, because, in fact, those experiments were visualized so, such a long time ago. And to some extent, what's happening is that young uh, uh, experimentalists with the digital uh, technologies are realizing ambitions of, of earlier generations of architects. They are actually honoring those earlier uh, uh, generations. One theory would be 
um, that when they finish doing that honoring, there will be another. They will generate uh, fantasies that will, will subsequent generations will then realize. Uh, and I think if, if, the, if the current generation is entirely devoted to realizing uh, fantasies of the 20s, um, there will be some concern. If there's in, in the middle of that also some fantasy that just seem utterly impossible, unreasonable, unacceptable, unethical, undoable, uh, unacceptable in every possible way, those will be the ones that perhaps in 20 years will be realized by another, another group of people. On the production side, so I think on the representation side, architects are, uh, are pretty good, pretty fast. <coughs> we didn't actually need the computer. That's the truth. We were able to do the work without it. It's fun to have the toys now, but it's, th it's not moving thinking that much. On the production side, quite the opposite. Architecture is low and slow. I defy you to name a lower technology field, any field that you can think of. I leave that in the audience. So somebody at the end, you win a prize. Um, you win a prize if you can think of a field whose technology is lower than architecture. But this is the field that uses and talks about technology more than any other field. Right? Even schools of technology don't talk about technology. Right? We talk about technology. Uh, because we are the lowest and slowest of all fields, your toothbrush is more sophisticated than the house. It's just a fact. No architect would be trusted, trusted to make a toothbrush. You know, I mean one of these new ones with this sort of biometric, responsive. So what is architecture? Of course, architecture is what it's always been, which is a reflection on technology, even a kind of writing of history of technology. It's, we are thinking, reflecting on technology, but we use the lowest possible technology to do that. In fact, to reflect upon technology, you, uh, the lowest technology is the, best, is the best way to do it, actually. Um, but we can get into that ultimately. Ultimately, you, you might even argue that we are so slow and so low um, that ultimately architecture is a form of resistance to the evolution in technology, that its primary <laughs> role is to sort of, or at least it's a kind of a, actually, I don't know why you find that funny. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'd like it to be funny, but uh, it's, I mean, I think that has been one of the purposes of architecture, to act as a resistance to time, or at least a valve, that is to say, to regulate time, and thereby uh, take away the trauma uh, that, that, that is time. Uh, Avant-garde architecture where it would be, at the very least, a total contradiction in terms. Not possible, not doable. And indeed, there we don't have a, a real evidence of an avant-garde uh, tradition and architecture in the same sense. Um, the obvious example would be to contrast the radical practices in the arts for in, in the 1910s and 20s with radical practices in architecture, and you notice that the languages are the opposite. Right? One team is alienation, defamiliarization, and shock, and the other team, our team, is all of the opposite terms. So it really, it, it really seems a, a, an odd thing to think of architecture as an avant-garde practice in, in that sense. And certainly, as was pointed out already today in one of the excellent papers, the uh, Russian situation is the clear reference point where revolution, uh, total change, total newness is aligned with what might be seen of as an avant-garde practice. And I think the so-called failure of that practice was not a failure of the specific projects of those people or even the political situation in which they were put. Very similar thing happened in Cuba after Castro took over where there was a flowering of radical work in the name of the desire for a totally new architecture to speak of a new society and all of that. The collapse was, a, yet again in that case, not, not a kind of collapse of uh, quality of the work, on the opposite, just a confusion about the role of the architect, it seems to me. The word new appears everywhere in architectural manifestos, reviews and histories and so on in the 1920s. It's a very big word in our field, especially in Germany, of course, where the word new is the word that is used rather than the word modern. So instead of modern architecture, it's the new architecture, or the new building, or the Neubau. Uh, this is happening in the 1920s. It peaks in 1927-28. A good early example, uh, example, as in so many things, is Bruno Tauert um, with his book on the new dwelling of 1924. But the real key moment is the Weisenhof Siedlung exhibition, 1927, the first kind of union show uh, of all the architects lined up. That exhibition launched a series of books, exhibitions, lecture series, lectures, and journals, all of which celebrated the use of the word new. Uh, even the exhibition itself contained another exhibition, the International Plan and Model Exhibition of New Architecture, which then traveled 17 cities over the next two years. Right? Basically, 
acting as a kind of virus of, of, uh, of the new. In association with the exhibition, there were at least six or seven books published with the word new in the title. Uh, uh, Adolf Bene's New Dwelling, New, new, new Building, uh, Berens' famous The Victory of the New Building Styles, uh, Platz's um, The Building Arts of, of the New Time, uh, Tout Again with, uh, with the New uh, Dwelling. Um, there were subsequent exhibitions that followed from that. The uh, Deutsche Werkbund in Basel did a Naua Bayern, Bayern uh, show. Uh, Ernst Meyer started producing films, short films, using that on the new buildings of uh, Frankfurt. Of course, his magazine, the, uh, the New Frankfurt, uh, starting in 26. Hans Richter is making movies. So basically, this word new is just pounding away, pounding away. And that word will quite literally, at a certain point, transition to uh, uh, modern. And there will be a transition from this very particular word Bauen and Baukunst, it will evolve into, uh, into architecture and the kind of key moment of that is when uh, Tout's 1929 book on the new building arts will be translated as modern architecture and be one of the, one of the books that plays a role in institutionalizing uh, the new. Uh, all of this, by the way, was underst understood to construct a new subject, a new human, new man. Uh, so the new architecture was a machinery for responding to and producing a new subject, a new whole new human being. Uh, but of course, I say it again, what is absolutely new for architecture could be terribly old for everybody else. So the fact that we're going to talking a lot about the word, a lot about new should, if anything, get us suspicious that things may not have been uh, so new. And I want, to I want to pursue the thought here that the celebration of new uh, can even operate as a kind of eulogy. And this is, this is the thesis that, that I want to present uh, uh, today. I found myself recently for the first time uh, giving a eulogy, and I suppose it's a, a stage in one's life that one ends up doing that. Um, and it occurs to me that the celebration of the new um, is, takes the form of a eulogy. And the reverse is true of eulogy, that eulogy requires one to celebrate the very life that has gone. But in order to celebrate it, it must be brought back into the room. It's not just referring to something that has gone. You actually have to resist uh, uh, and I think the reverse is true. Uh, I'm suggesting to you the reverse might be true, that the celebration of the new operates in the form of a eulogy, which is to say 1920s in architecture is dominated by a eulogy, which takes the form of announcing the grand new arrival of a new architecture, a new society, a new human being, a new form of biology even. In fact, I want to argue to you that any celebration of the new always necessarily takes the form of a eulogy, that is to say a description of uh, at the scene of a death. Uh, and I'm going to quickly try to give you the evidence for this. Let's take the most obvious examples, the most influential manifesto of modern architecture and the most influential history of modern architecture. The most influential manifesto, of course, towards an architecture of 1923. Essays taken from uh, the Journal of Le, Cres of Le Crebrisier, uh, L'Esprit Nouveau, the new spirit, the new, all about the new, right? Uh, articles produced 1920-21, which go into the book of, uh, uh, of 23. The most compact version of his theory, of course, coming out in 1926, the five points for what? For a new architecture. So it seems like Le Corbusier is unambiguously on the side of the new, and even when he formulates his rules, it's for a new uh, architecture. And what does he say of the five points for a new architecture? He says, architectural facts, so it's no longer a question of uh, uh, theory anymore, it's, these are just the facts, that imply an entirely new way of building, so not just new, but entirely new, uh, which you'd think would be unnecessary, <laughs> like when somebody says that's really true, <laughs> or it goes without saying that, or I mean, so you just, you know, the, an entirely new, you have to be suspicious, because <laughs> when somebody says, when somebody adds an adjective, what they're saying is, this is my wish, I wish it's true. The way you wish something to be true is to, to announce that it, yeah, of, co of course you say, of course, without doubt, uh, but if there's no doubt, you don't have to say that. Right? So entirely new way of building, he's saying, I hope, uh, a fundamentally new aesthetic. Nothing is left to us of the architecture of past epochs. So entire, entire it's a Leninist citation, right? All of the old out in favor of the new. But actually, as, as Brett already pointed out, um, the translation into English of towards a new architecture, which is coming from that five points uh, uh, thing of 26, that misunderstanding, uh, deeply misunderstands the central argument of the book, which is not about the future at all, but about the past. <coughs> uh, and actually, the word new is not very common in Le Corbusier. If you do a sort of account, he's not big on the word new. Um, 
What is the basic argument of the book? The basic argument, as you know, is that it's about time that architects would catch up with engineers who have been the only ones who were awake during the 19th century. And this book begins with an image of a bridge by E. Fell. And basically he says we have to learn from the engineers, we have to join from them. They are modern, they're elegant, they're beautiful, but we will add art, we will transcend all of that and we'll beat them in the end. Um, but it seems like we're a little bit late because this is 1923 and the bridge is you know, in the middle of the 19th century. So uh, we seem to be a long way back. So it's a sort of marathon race with the engineer uh, uh, up in front. What's his model? Essentially, it's an evolutionary model of design. He treats, as you know, he treat, you know all of this extremely well. He treats machines as organisms driven by design. So you're designing, uh, but you're participating in a system of, uh, of evolution. The most, his most famous argument is, of course, to suggest that the Parthenon is an industrial product that was perfected through experiment, returning to this question of experiment, experiment that went through the centuries until finally it was perfected, and as it was perfected, it transcends time to become a work of art. So all temples are disposable, interestingly, right, because a temple is exactly that building whose program it is to defeat time, to position yourself uh, uh, in the world, but give yourself special access to the higher truths of the universe, to be to on, on reaching, not even reaching that platform, to observe the harmonic resonance of the proportions is to activate the actual hum, harmonic resonances of the universe and therefore to leave the world behind and to leave time behind. Right? Uh, so this machine for perfecting time itself took time to perfect and, and it happened with the Parthenon, which is then as beautiful as an automobile. <coughs> so he makes this surrealist uh, reversal. And as you know, the book ends with the final chapter, Architectural Revolution, and as you know, he's on the side of architecture, not revolution. He says, in every domain of industry, new problems have been posed and new equipment created to solve them. Human tools, hitherto subject only to slowly evolving changes, have now been transformed with fabulous speed. So he says it's been a very slow evolution, it's suddenly speeded up, which creates new formulas, but then he comes out finally on the side of evolution rather than revolution, and he ends with the comment, the advent of a new age intervenes only when earlier work has quietly prepared the way. So you, yes, there's a new age, and yes, you can point to it, but you can only point to it because this loud, new, fabulous age, because very, very quietly that age has been set up over a considerably long period of time. In other words, loud, rapid change, newness, becomes the effect of quiet, slow changes. Right? So most red manifesto of architecture declares that Modern architecture is the product of one and a half centuries of quiet evolution th throughout which the architect was asleep at the wheel and finally is, is meant to catch up in, in 1925 to move toward an architecture is not to move toward the future but is actually toward, to move towards the discoveries of the middle of the 19th century and understand what their implications are for uh, humanity. Then you take the most influential history of modern architecture, Z. Freakinian Space, Time and Architecture, a book whose main mission is to insert time into architecture and to say what it is that makes modern architecture modern is that it fully articulates the uh, uh, endless complexity and flow uh, uh, of time, the four dimensions and so on. The subtitle, of course, very important, The Growth of a New Tradition. By the way, the new tradition seems to be a paradox, right? And of course, if you've already listened to me uh, you re realize that it's not a paradox at all. The new is exactly a tradition. It is an institution. It can only be uh, a, a tradition. And it grows, right? the growth of a new tradition. Um, his argument is, again, strictly evolutionary. He has a section at the introduction called Architecture as Organism, in case you don't get the point. He said it's the general line of, of evolution which interests us. The history of architecture is an enterprise with a continuous and independent growth of its own. It has a life of its own. It grows, dwindles, finds new potentialities and forgets them again, the view of architecture as a growing organism. In other words, it's, it has, he says it literally has a life, which means it can be stupid, right? Can forget things, lose its way, find itself somewhere else. He says, he goes on, its value cannot be stated in the sociological or economic terms by which we explain its origin, and its influence may continue after its original environment has altered or disappeared. So architecture can, be, can emerge within one environmental condition, but actually take its meaning in an entirely different environmental condition. And again, of course, this is the logic of evolution, of adaption uh, to new societies. He's talking about an organism in a changing environment. Again, you remember totally, I hope, his basic argument that construction uh, is the unconscious, is the new reality that emerges 
uh, uh, over time, specifically in the industrialization of building, the new techniques of iron and glass, which create new potentials, which the architect is so afraid of that the architect is only becomes barely able to deal with them in the 20th century. He says, basically, that architects are traumatized by new technologies, and by new he means 100-year-old technologies, uh, and the period has moved towards self-consciousness, he calls it. Basically, architects, he says, are the last. <coughs> Everybody in the universe got used to iron and glass, and then finally the architects managed uh, to do it. He totally rejects, he says, he rejects the idea that architecture, modern architecture, quote, owes its foundation to a few innovators appearing around 1900. He, re he absolutely slams the idea that a group of heroes suddenly arrived and created a new architecture. He says, the seeds of this new architecture were planted at the moment when hand, hand work gave place to industrialized uh, production. He means the middle of the 18th century. So the seeds of this thing happened in the, in the 18th century. Uh, his model for what it is that happened, the industrialization itself is, is an or, or automata, like an artificial human, right? So he shows an 18th century artificial human and says, here lies the full aspiration of industrialization, that everything in our world, including ourselves, would be a machine. And so machine life and the possibility of machine life become the model. And he says the excitement of this led to the industrialization of almost every human pursuit except architecture. And he says it, quote, scarcely reflected in architectural, uh, in official architecture, only in everyday uh, uh, construction. Then he goes on and he says, but life is complex in and irrational. When its evolution is blocked in one direction, it seeks another. What he means is, when the architects didn't bother to do anything with this, other people stepped up and worked on it. Engineers didn't have any problem working with these advantages. So the, basically the, the ideas just, just channeled themselves through engineering. It seeks another and often unex entirely unexpected outlet. In following its material urge, industry consciously creates new powers of expression and new possibilities of experience. Slowly and gradually, the new potentialities became part of private and individual life. They became domesticated. Right, and he speaks a lot, and he speaks very eloquently about the domestication of industrial technology. And he means ultimately the domestication into the human body. Right? The history of this metamorphosis, uh, we could think about that word, right, is in large measure the history of the 19th century. So the 19th century is the century of the domestication uh, of these technologies, and he quite likes the houses of Victor Horta towards the end of the, of the 19th century, which he's, he sees as being the very first houses to attempt to domesticate, literally domesticate, the steel and glass uh, uh, developments. And then he says, finally these potentialities come to be realized for what they are in themselves apart from the conditions of utility. The architecture of today stands at the end of such a process. In other words, precisely when it's no longer a question of what this technology is doing, of its utility, at that moment the architect says, okay, now it's my turn, because I'm not into, into utility, I'm into reflections upon utility, and I'm willing to wait 150 years until you guys have got used to this, and then I'll get used to it. Um, finally, architecture then embraces 19th century combinations of iron and glass that had led to new uh, uh, solutions. So the very important thing is architecture only steps in after technology has been domesticated. It's already in the private house by the time the architect wakes up. The beginning of the wake up is of course the Crystal Palace in 1851, but very, very interestingly, he describes that as an extremely odd and premature artistic reflection on the new technologies. And he says it just was just a very odd thing that Paxton was able to understand what was going on and produce that building. He says that in fact, it's not until 1889 with the gallery of machines that finally you, there's a fully self-conscious uh, uh, engagement with the same issue. For architects, 1910 is the, moment, is the therapeutic moment. He says that up until 1910, architects tried to find ways to develop a new feeling, what he calls a new feeling uh, for space. And after 1910, the discovery of a new space conception happened with architects, as he said, working in their studios as if in a laboratory. So again, this model of experimentation. The key building is, of course, Walter Gropius' Fagas, Fagas' work in, of 1911, which he describes as a sudden and unexpected statement of a new architectonic language. Uh, so what he's sort of saying is in 1911, there's a sudden arrival of modern architecture. It's new, but what it is that's new is just that we've been repressed for 150 years, and finally we sort of, as it were, let it out. And he says, anyway, that, was, that building was described as a, regarded as a totally weird aberration, and in fact, it's not until the 1920s that architects start to get... Uh, 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 with it. So basically architecture can produce the effect 
the sudden and unexpected effect of the new by finally waking up to developments of 150 years old. And that's what I mean when I say if you're looking at architecture and you see something that's new, what you might be just looking at is finally architects assuming their, in, in their, their kind of mandate of being the very last to enter into uh, uh, any game. Or to put it more precisely, architects enter the game when it's not a game anymore. Right? So it raises questions then about what our role is. Meanwhile, we talk about heroic experimentalization and so on, but in fact, our structural position is different. Even Gropius, he said, was a totally isolated exception that could not make its influence uh, felt. So the new tradition starts in the 1920s. So what's the basic point here? Is for Gideon, the new is a very slow product. New is something that takes a lot of time uh, uh, pr to produce. Even iron, he says, he, he points out, it's not a new material, it's an ancient material, but was transformed with industrialization, with cast iron, uh, in the middle of the 18th century, and that produced then a totally new subject, that switch in an old, that mutation of an old material. He said it became new and fascinating and just simply could not be employed too much. Everybody wanted to use it everywhere uh, 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 all the time. Um, a century later, in the 1840s and 50s, it's still regarded as a new material and it's still regarded as exciting. And because it's regarded by almost everybody as, ex as exciting, architects won't touch it. That's what he's saying. That it's just too exciting, it's too hot. Right? Uh, it still had what he calls something of the fabulous about it. And the last thing architects wanted to be was fabulous. The Crystal Palace, he says, is the realization of a whole new conception of building for which there was no precedent. Uh, and he said it was described at the time as a revolution in architecture from which a new style will surely come. And that the standards by which architecture had hitherto been judged no longer uh, were held good. But then he points out that it was a way ahead of its time and nobody got it, nobody wanted it. Even after the palace and even after the gallery of machines, he said, architects remained totally nervous. They still, after another century, kept covering up iron with a masquerade uh, of the historical styles. Uh, and he says, nevertheless, underneath this nervous skin, the technology was growing and evolving. And at some point, it was going to burst out. And there's an explicitly Freudian language used throughout this book. And in, in the typical Freudian way, the repressed will emerge. And at some point, it does. He's basically described, and he, at one point in a brilliant moment on page 142, if you're interested, he describes what he considers to be the normal 80-year interval, interval between the discovery of an important new principle and its assimilation into everyday life. So his theory is that a new discovery takes 80 years to get into everyday life. The actual story he's telling is that it takes 80 years for a new discovery to get into everyday life and another 80 years for architects to pick it up, <laughs> which gives you a 160 span. His book is a, is, a, is a history of 160 years, <laughs> right? He do, and, 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 wha and do we do it because we, so we finally wake up? No, we do it because we're forced to. He says, all unconsciously, the constructor played the role of scout for the architect, right? The new expedients which he kept pressing upon the architect continually forced the architect to venture into unexplored territory. It remains one of the chief functions of construction to furnish architecture with a stimulus and incentive for new growth. So basically, engineers keep prodding the architects and telling them to wake up. They still don't wake up. In Gideon's point of view, they wake up when they feel their own extinction, when they realize that their species, the species of the architect, will not survive unless they engage with the new technology. Maybe that's the problem of today. If, if the young generation doesn't feel uh, at risk, a survival of risk, they may, not, they may not do so well. He has a section called New Building Problems, New Solutions, and he says, yes, in the 19th century, buildings which owe nothing to the past began to appear. Their new our lines originated in the, in the demands posed by big towns and by industrialization and thereby communication and so on. Already he notes that in the middle of the 19th century, lots of people said we better get a new architecture. And he quotes them all. He just has a series of quotes to point out that they're there. And all of them use the word new. He puts it in a section called the demand for a new architecture. So he talks about poets, engineers, artists, architects, politicians. He gets a whole range of people all saying we need something uh, new. They even put it in evolutionary terms. One of the quotes says, we need, uh, just like a new race of plants or animals only appears after the disappearance of the old, in architecture it's the same, we need to get rid of the old and have the new. But architects are so anxious that nothing happens despite all of this pressure, they finally figure out that they're going to die and then they evolve. Right? So they start evolving in the 20s to handle this problem. Remember, this is the book written by the secretary of CM so the Secretary of the Union devoted to promoting the success of modern architecture, which is singling out as the number one characteristic of modern architecture, 
is that it's, a, it's an, an attempt to understand what happened 160 years earlier. That what its primary contribution to society is, is, is an ability to reflect <coughs> intelligently upon something that happened 160 years ago. So what makes it modern is not that it's new, but that it's thinking, thinking about the old, right? And this is in the Ra 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 uh, 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 manifesto, right? Finally, the architects join in, right? And then he has a series of quotes from the architects finally joining in. And of course, one of the quotes is Le Corbusier again from the very issues of L'Esprit Nouveau in which the manifesto is taken where Le Corbusier says, the century of the machine has awakened the architect. Same language, same tone, new tasks and new possibilities produced him. Right, so quite a uh, very good writer, Le Corbusier, and, and, and uh, despite what his mother thought, by the way. She thought he was a terrible writer and he used to always send her all of his stuff and she would brutally edit it and say, you're an idiot. And after, <laughs> after a while, he figured out that he actually his, his way of writing, he, he then took, he embraced it and said he actually understood that it's telegraphic. And it is, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting way of, uh, uh, of writing. Anyway, to move fast. Gideon and the whole generation around agreed with this view. Right? That was the normative view. This is not a kind of complex uh, uh, theory. Uh, Gideon says, new tasks await architecture today. It, there are new needs that have to be met. A living architecture must succeed in satisfying these sub-rational emotional responses, uh, which are deeply rooted in our age, deeply rooted in the, uh, uh, in the response to technology. So modern architecture is a post-utilitarian reflection on the new utilitarian sensibility of the 19th century. So the whole form follows function, the whole kind of functionalist rhetoric to, to imagine that modern architecture was to perform in those ways was to misunderstand. The performance was to make the functional, make the utilitarian, make the industrial thematic, to make it something to be discussed, to be reflected on. The newness of modern architecture was, as it were, literally historical. In other words, it's a sort of historical uh, 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 effect. <coughs> so the absolute newness of the Crystal Palace, of the Gallery of Machines, and of the the Eiffel Tower, and of course it's the Eiffel Tower that finally uh, Gideon zooms in and says, look at that, that is space-time, that's Einstein, that's it. He says it's at once the climax and the conclusion of a long development. So the shock of the Eiffel Tower, and you know perfectly it was a shock for everybody, the shock is, is the kind of coming to the surface of the long, long uh, technological development <coughs> which did not find its equivalent in architecture until decades later, but primarily Gideon's purpose was to show that there are buildings like those of Le Corbusier's that have the qualities uh, uh, of the Tower Eiffel. He actually ends up with the reverse formula. He says, connection with the past is a prerequisite for the appearance of a new and self-confident tradition. So actually you have to engage with the past in an intellectual way to generate uh, the new. This is different from those people who would say, oh, modern architecture is misunderstood, it did have a kind of historical consciousness and all of that. No, no, this is something different. What it is that made it modern was the way it read history and worked with history as history, not as the new. It only did that work when, ev when the technology had already uh, uh, moved on. Le Corbusier's villas constructed of handcrafted masonry with stucco over them, described as machine-like, is the absolute uh, 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 embodiment of that. Um, the continued use of the expression high tech to describe large buildings with nuts and bolts as without laughter uh, is a sign that we still are able to suspend judgment in that way. We still regard uh, any building that looks like something that you could do as a child has, is officially labeled high tech in this country, anyway. <laughs> um, it really raises the question of what would be low tech then for architecture. If big pieces of steel with big bolts uh, uh, constitute high tech. But you see, our ability to look at a Le Corbusier Villa and say modern and not say no. Pre-modern, handcraft, expensive, slow, not moving, artwork, not machine. Our ability to suspend our judgment is because we are not in the business of making buildings but of reflecting upon buildings, even if it involves making a building that reflects <laughs> upon it, right? Okay, the whole position of Gideon then is already laid out in his first book, uh, which was first presented by him in a lecture series called Now a Bayern, a new building again. In 1928, he wrote to his friends that he's wor working on a book on the new architecture. So he's writing about the new, he's embracing the new, celebrating the new, but what is the new? The new is a reflection on the old. He says in his introduction to that book, we see that the architecture we now describe as new, 
and he puts in inverted, inverted commas, is a legitimate part of an entire century of development. So he's explicitly saying the word new is a, is a word to describe uh, one century. Uh, again, he talks about the tower, uh, uh, Eiffel's Tower. He says, he says of it, all flesh has been left off. Everything is reduced to connective parts, and the air is drawn into the interior uh, of the columns, which now become in an unprecedented way a formative material. The air itself becomes the material uh, uh, of the tower. He then, when talking about Le Corbusier's houses, says air flows into them. Air becomes the constituent feature. So in other words, there is this uh, attempt to see in the works of Le Corbusier exactly the qualities that had become unconsciously evident uh, earlier. All of his insistence on life, interpenetration, fluidity, stream of movement, fluctuations, blur, boundaries, and so on, that's the same language of the computer generation of today. Right? It's the identical language. And we have to reflect upon the relationship between that understanding of the Eiffel Tower and that understanding of that object out there, which is trying to tell us that it's made of air. So, and I mean this not as a criticism of that object. On the contrary, that is an object participating in this new tradition, but it's a new tradition started in the 1920s for us. Right? Uh, what's all this doing? Of course, it's to do with evolution uh, and explicitly a sort of uh, a confusion or intersection of Darwin and Freud. Staying with the Darwin side, you know perfectly Darwin, origin of the species, 1859, so right in that moment there, right? Just after uh, uh, 1851, right? Just in that moment, uh, which I think you all have an image of. What's Darwin's book? It's a theory of novelty. It's a theory of newness. The central theory is He's trying to explain how novelty can have the look of design, but be, there's no design there. Right? That's, the th you know, that's the central principle of the book, versus the idea of novelty as an effect of design, right? which is what you might hear of more from the so-called digital generation, that we can produce novelty, that we have uh, the capacity to access the novel through the parametric freedoms that allow us to endlessly reproduce more and more options. Of course, Darwin's book is full of the word new, new forms, new flora, new species, new home, new conditions of life, new characters, new strain, new subbreeds, new races, new breeds, and so on, on and on and on. He rejects the idea that you can create a new being, a new organic being outright. He speaks rather of what he calls the preservation and accumulation of infinitesimally small inherited modifications. Uh, new forms, he says, are continuously and slowly being produced. So you recognize the, Gide the Gideon sensibility, that the new slowly is emerged through absolutely minor variations which are preserved and accumulated. And that's the, maybe there are really three stages, right? That there is uh, the production of mutations through chance, the preservation of those mutations, they have to keep going, and the accumulation, they keep uh, accumulating. Those are the conditions for the production uh, of novelty. And he shows, from a technical point of view, how the radically different can emerge from the minor, minor change, how minor change can lead to major change. He speaks of the manufacturing of a new species through this kind of evolution. He has this concept of what he calls an incipient species, which is to say in the middle of a series of variations, there is the thought of a new species there which hasn't quite uh, uh, arrived. He says that varieties, quote, tend to become converted into new and distinct species. So just small variations have the possibility of being distinct. He has a brilliant chapter called Difficulty of Theory, and I think there should be a chapter with that name in every book uh, in our field. Difficulty of theory, which is where he's trying to explain the difficulties of his own position, right? And in there he points out that there's a tendency of what, what he's going to refer to as natural selection, that both the parents and all the variations are going to be exterminated when the new form emerges. That it's one of the consequences of arg his argument that when a new species em emerges, that it has a particular survival advantage under particular conditions, all of the variations that led to that species that don't have quite the same survival advantage will of course die out. So actually one of the consequences of the production of the new is the death and irrelevance and extermination of what will now be considered the old. Right? So there is a sort of a death, extermination, extinction code built into this and that <coughs> extinction of the variations in the code which is what leads us to imagine that the new species has been designed and designed fresh because we don't see the history precisely. Again you could say D uh, Darwin is a, is a historian uh, uh, of, of variation. So basically, d the difference of a new form, the sense of it as a new form, hides all of its own history and hides its variation. So one of the properties, of course, of the new species is the erasure of the conditions for its own uh, uh, production. The effect of design then becomes, the is the design is the effect of erasing 
uh, variations, meaningless var variations. So meaningful design and some, the sense of a meaningful and purposeful design comes actually from a kind of purposeless uh, uh, activity, which is another kind of neat uh, reversal of the Gideon argument from utility to beyond utility. Uh, more precisely, uh, uh, immediately, for our purposes anyway, immediately uh, uh, Darwin uh, had an enemy, uh, Samuel Butler, who within the very year, that uh, 1859, that Darwin produces his book, uh, Butler, made the counter argument. I want to quickly sketch out some of the key features of that. He said Darwin is completely wrong. Uh, it's not like that at all. Um, that in fact the evolution of biological uh, uh, species, there is a sort of tele teleological uh, uh, thing going on, something like a design thing going on. But in the world of machines, Darwin is entirely correct. So what he says is machines do evolve in exactly the same way uh, that he's uh, talking about. Uh, so in, in other words, Machines have, machines have an organic evolution from his point of view and uh, organisms actually operate more like machines. They're designed, <laughs> right? That's his argument. He describes all machines as prosthetic limbs, as extensions of the body. Uh, he says, describes them as part of the human, even part of what makes the humans human, right? In as much as we live by virtue of our prosthetic extensions, our life is in those extensions. He then, he then runs two parallel arguments. <coughs> One argument says that um, uh, the machine is a race of creatures that uses humans to reproduce. Right? So he describes humans as what he calls the sex organs of machines. That we, in thinking that we're developing a new s a system of steel, are actually just allowing steel to evolve by carrying the idea from one place to another. And he says, according to that theory, uh, where we are the sex organs of the machines, they actually treat us really well. <laughs> right, you know, he, he says at one point, we shouldn't be worried, they, they, it's in their interest to kind of take care of us. But we are the servant. <laughs> then he runs the other theory which says that actually uh, all machines are extensions of our body and in as, in as much as they're extensions of our body, they are our body and they are fully human and therefore of course we will, if we take care of ourselves, be okay. And he, s he goes further, he says, man's very soul is due to machines. It is a machine-made thing, right? So your soul is a machine-made thing. So this is the arguments he's making. Now this argument is directly picked up by Le Corbusier. Uh, uh, Samuel Butler's book, uh, Life and Habit of 1877, appears in the reading list of the very same issue of L'Esprit Nouveau in which the argument is made for a new architecture. They're recommending that people read that. Le Corbusier repeatedly paraphrases uh, Butler's argument. And again, you'll, when you read his description of the organic development uh, of machines, it's really uh, a, a very uh, kind of Butler view. And the same thing is echoed within, uh, uh, within uh, Gideon. <coughs> You will recognize also that very similar arguments are to be found in, in Bergson's creative evolution. Uh, uh, and again, Bergson is a more interesting, th it's just so hard to read Bergson in the kind of post Deleuzian uh, moment because almost nobody can simply open it up and read the text without uh, 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 dropping into it what they think Deleuze uh, meant. Uh, those of you who are fortunate enough not to have read Deleuze could read Bergson uh, those of you who have already read uh, uh, Deleuze, I would say stay with Deleuze because he's great. But you don't, you don't then need to go and read Bergson to pretend that you're sort of trying to understand the source of, uh, uh, of Deleuze's thinking because you will not be able to read uh, at all. Um, so if you're like me and you don't read Deleuze, you have the advantage of going back and looking at the book. Um, Deleuze, Bergson is of, is, of course, the most committed to the concept of novelty as such. I mean, he's really a great uh, uh, expert on, 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 on novelty. He is a little bit with, uh, on the sort of Samuel Butler side of the fence because he also doesn't think that mutations are a chance event and he develops a kind of, again, a sort of a teleological point of view. Here's, here's a, here are some quick indicative quotes from, from him. He says, the ultimate effects of an invention are not observed until its novelty is already out of sight. You don't understand the effect of the technology until it's actually no longer novel. He says, a century has elapsed since the invention of the steam engine, and he's writing this in 1907, uh, we are only just beginning to feel the depths of the shock it gave us. Right? New, to new ideas, new feelings, new tools. So the steam engine is a shocking invention that creates the possibility of new ideas, new feelings, new tools, but we still haven't recovered from the shock a century later. He also describes all of the tools with which we work as extensions of our body. In fact, he describes exactly the intellect as that, the intellect being that capacity to turn the material world into part of your body, to treat it as an extension of your body. And he opposes uh, intellect and intuition on exactly those 
uh, grounds. And this division of intellect and, and tuition exactly maps onto um, Butler's distinction between uh, organic machines being design driven and machines being uh, uh, mutation driven. He says intellect has the capacity to turn matter into an organ, into, into a, an appendage, and matter, in fact, the whole material world becomes an immense prosthetic extension uh, of the body. And then he says what follows from this, and these are the key points, he says the intellect is not made to think evolution. Uh, and, what he, and he goes on to say, he says precisely because it's always trying to recon reconstitute and reconstitute with what it's given, the intellect lets what is new in each moment of history escape. Like precisely because it's busy turning the world to its advantage, it cannot see the new. The new is what escapes it. He says again, uh, innumerable living beings almost alike have to repeat each other in space and time for the novelty they're working out to grow and mature. In other words, again, millions of little operations in which the new itself is invisible will actually ultimately lead, lead to the possibility of the new arriving. And again, you recognize, and of course you know perfectly that Bergson's <coughs> arguments are extremely influential in intellectual culture at that time. He then goes on and says, you actually cannot see the new, right? Uh, you cannot see the endless uh, 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 variation. Now, Bergson claims not to have known Butler's uh, viewpoint. That seems unlikely, but they, he was formally introduced to that viewpoint when he visited London in 1914. It doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, they're different positions, but they overlap. But both of them are influential on the figures that do matter to us, in this case, Le Corbusier and Gideon. Uh, Marshall McLuhan's position, of course, is directly coming from Samuel Butler, who he studied as a student, quotes in his early writings, and then forgets to quote when he comes out with his most famous book in 1964, Understanding Media, which exactly re repeats line by line a number of Butler's uh, comments. Um, McLuhan and Buckminster Fuller then get into a fight over who invented the idea of the fact that prosthetic technology uh, uh, extends the human body and the fact that it's so shocking this extension that one does never see the technology that has just changed one's body that in McLuhan point of view you see only the technology before each new uh, uh, prosthetic is so traumatic that it's invisible to us until it has become uh, 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 redundant um, McLuhan and, and uh, Fuller argue about whose idea it was uh, and of course in the end it was neither neither of them were wi willing to acknowledge that it was uh, Butler okay so now to get back to this question, so you can hear that in f you can hear that I've already been able to reinforce my view that, that the new is exactly that which you cannot see. I want to quickly deal with the end, right? So here is uh, Darwin, Butler, Bergson, Gideon, and McLuhan, a little bit collapsed together for you, uh, crudely here, into a single theory of novelty. Uh, it's a theory in which the technological world is understood as uh, a world of thought. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, 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 pr the prosthetic extension of the body as an extension of, of intelligence, as a means of intelligence. Three qu quick points then. The new is the product of endless variations. Uh, number two, newness is the effect of suppressing variation. The sense of newness is the suppression of the, what it is that produces it. And three, the new itself, the really new, the new new, uh, cannot be seen until it's too late, until it's not new, right? Modern architecture fits, of course, exactly into this logic. That's why it comes late, comes slow. It is exactly that, a reflection on this prosthetic logic and was explicitly presented in those terms. But its primary role was to act as a shock absorber. But imagine that, a shock absorber after 160 years. That's a, that, that indicates that the position of the architect is much, much more uh, in a resistance mode than we have been willing to acknowledge. The digital, so-called digital, clearly maintains the modern project. Uh, that is to say, I would argue that the people who are using computers today, in which include myself, are afraid of the non-modern consequences of electronics. We are really unprepared to carry out experiments with those electronics that will produce results other than those that could be valued using the terms that we have used to praise the architecture of the 1920s. So we are really afraid of that. Uh, and we are using uh, uh, these technologies in extremely narrow ways, I would argue, in order to not run the risk uh, uh, of those consequences. The language of time, which you see everywhere in the writings of every uh, young architect, it's actually how you identify yourself as a young architect, you talk a lot about time, um, establishes your faithful credentials as a card-carrying member of the architects of the 1920s, and again, what I'm arguing to you is all that talk about time is in fact uh, all about the resistance to time. But it's presented to you as 
hey, let's go with time, um, and so on. In other words, it's carrying out the most classic function of architecture, which is to resist time, and in resisting it, allow it to, to be, right? So the, essentially, uh, everything else in everything else and this becomes then our definition of life itself, has time and is allowed to have time by virtue of the fact that architecture resists time, or at least acts as a regulating goal, which gives time a kind of image. And by virtue of having an image, we can then see ourselves as having uh, a, a life. This is, by the way, a backwards defense of the figure of the architect, because it suggests that without the architect, we would not be able to have a life, right? If you think about it, we'd not be able to live. Uh, and indeed, if you read the sound of the architect, this is what we think we do offer. We offer the opportunity to, as it were, see life. Not, not necessarily to have it, but to see it. Uh, not by chance, the preservation of, uh, of modern architecture begins in exactly the same year as the use of digital graphics. Even the invention of the word digital graphics comes in the same year as the first buildings of Le Corbusier are being uh, preserved. Because the fear of the new, I'm slowly trying to suggest to you, is always a question of preservation. It's always about preservation. It's equally about the fear of the old. The celebration of the new is always, always about, and ultimately more about in the old than anything else. It's very hard for us to appreciate the novelty uh, of the truly old. We are, we are very much in the mindset that that which will shock us is in front of us, right? And therefore, architecture plays its part in creating a time frame such that, that we we are allowed not to see that thing which lies in front of us. But of course, what's much more deeply shocking, because we cannot even understand the concept, is the novelty of the old, which is to say the surprising uh, freshness and dangerous, strange freshness uh, of the truly old. Uh, and it's not the old like the old that we pee on. Remember, <coughs> getting back to the dog, the uh, peeing on the new and the old. Just as what's really new is not what we call new, but what seems to lie beyond that, what we call old is not what worries us either, but what seems to lie uh, uh, beyond that as well. Preservation is therefore the secret partner of what we call the avant-garde. And it's always there as a kind of closet uh, uh, partner, allowing us to set up this framework of old and new, the avant-garde busy setting up their monuments to the new, while the preservationists quickly position themselves preserving uh, the old, but they're operating on different time frames. Right, they're preserving different moments of the time, and they create then a space which we can think of as the space of everyday uh, life. They mark old and new as kind of bookends of anonymous everyday life. But these bookends are also walls that protect us from the shock of novelty in all forms, the shock of the old and the new. Um, now, the shock of the new, uh, to finish here, is really, I think I've already said it, but I want to say it again, is really the shock of loss. It's really about the silent death. Um, and this is the thing that's hardest for us to, to, to deal with. Uh, this is why I'm saying to you, I think the form of the new, of the celebration of the new, is always the form of the eulogy. It's a eulogy only given in architecture when the death itself has already been accepted. In other words, it's only when the technology has run its course that we will step up and make the, the eulogy, but the eulogy with the strange form of announcing that the world has just changed. In other words, we don't say, we don't look back, we claim to look forward, but in fact, what we're doing is marking the fact that a certain death is now uh, uh, acceptable. But that acceptable death, that sort of, as it were, honorable death, is just a kind of defensive uh, 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 marker. The truly new is not that which lies ahead of us on the other side of what we mark as new. The truly new is, is I, I mean, I shouldn't say these things, but it's everywhere and frightening in being everywhere all the time. And this is what um, Bergson and Butler and Darwin are explaining very well, that what's really surprising is variation, is mutation itself, and we can't see it, and we can't even see its consequences. In other words, what's really frightening is the inexplicab in inexplicable arrival of things, uh, equally the inexplicable departure of things, right? So. What is truly new is that which defeats our careful framing gesture, our careful definition of what's uh, in front of us and what's uh, behind us. Like, likewise, I would say, uh, what is truly old is also defeating that system. What is truly old might, in a certain sense, seem, even seem to be uh, 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 in front of us. So, 
to finish. We, what we need of is a sort of a theory, not just of death, but really of extinction. We really need to understand extinction if you want to understand uh, giving birth to new forms and so on. And I, I, can, I can help maybe help you understand what I mean by just noting one thing. Every time somebody celebrates the news, somebody else gets up and grieves at the same time. And this is not by accident. In other words, every time somebody gets up and says, hey, digital is great, somebody else gets up and says, but people are not drawing with a hand anymore. <laughs> and those two things belong together. In other words, the moment of announcement of the new must coincide with the nostalgia for things that were never what they were. Right? And you have a nostalgia, we all have this nostalgia for a life we never had. And the only excuse we get to say we used to have a life was when somebody else says it's gone and there's something new. So what happens is, and you can see it, that both sides of the argument understand that very well, and they, that's what I mean by a secret partnership. This kind of arrival of, of a celebration of the new and a kind of grieving of a previous uh, <coughs> moment. So if you're in a school like this one, and like my one, which is dedicated to radical experimentation, which sees as its primary role kind of endless parallel processing, obsessed with possible forms of new forms of the discipline, I actually think in order to proceed with our work, we need a more elaborate theory of extinction. And extinction is not just the extreme case of loss. It's not just like big loss. Uh, just as the new is not the extreme case of novelty. It's not like just the super new. Actually, it's the sort of non-super new. That's what's unacceptable about it. Um, the radically old is that which defeats the measure, defeats the, the measure of time that, that we are called on by society uh, to offer. It's, if, if you like, and these words are inadequate, it's the countless little deaths that occur all the time. What's shocking about them is not the death, but the pleasure associated for us with that, the witnessing of that and the participation uh, of that, which is to say it's a living process at the heart of, every, of the everyday and yet unable to be, as it were, effaced. Just as the form of the new it takes the form of a eulogy, uh, we need, I think, more radical theories of loss, of history, of preservation, and so on, to contribute to our experimental uh, project, uh, it seems to me. And I think, in a way, uh, I if... I mean, it's just that one little sentence of Darwin is important, the preservation and accumulation of variations. He has this preservation uh, concept in there, and he doesn't offer a very particularly good explanation of, of, of how that uh, happens. You, n you know that... Um, the monster, that which does not, could not reproduce, dies. You, you know that it's a scene of, uh, it's a scene of endless uh, departures. And that's what produces the new, right? So the new is a sort of, um, um, is a sort of a battlefield uh, of a kind. And I think uh, some more complex understanding of that would, um, I don't know, be interesting, I think. <laughs> Anyway, we need to do something like that, like get with death for a bit. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much and then uh, thank you very much.